Congratulations, you've escaped the thermal radiation, the blast, and the firestorm from a nuclear detonation. Now you have to deal with the fallout. I think most people know that the fallout is dangerous from a nuclear detonation, but I don't think a lot of them know why, or even what the fallout actually looks like. I think most people believe it looks like dust, ash, you know, or even snow, confusing it with a nuclear winter. Not at all. Although you can actually find fallout dust, even though it's pretty rare, the nuclear fallout looks more like little pieces of glass or sand. You see, when the fireball rises above the ground, tons of dirt, debris, and buildings are all sucked up into the intense heat, which melts the material and drops it in the higher layers of the atmosphere, where it cools and crystallizes. From there, it drops back down to Earth, downwind from the blast. That's fallout. Now understand, if the nuclear blast is an airburst, way above a city or above the ground, you're going to have very little fallout because of that. The original bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were actually designed to detonate at 2,000 feet above the ground. Why? Because the U.S. was actually planning an invasion which was going to be following the nuclear blast if they had to, and they didn't want to actually harm any GIs going into the country. If it's a surface burst, you'll have lots of fallout. And of course, the fallout will have very high radioactive levels that can last for years. It can. Radioactivity and what to look for in the radioactive material will be discussed in the next video, however. For right now, we just want to have a general protection from fallout overall. Another type of explosion is called a water burst. In this case, large amounts of water flash to steam and are taken into the atmosphere. And there are even smaller particles, which therefore the winds can actually carry them further from the detonation, but surprisingly, they actually have lower radiation. But we're not out of the woods. In this particular type of fallout, it often seeps into concrete and steel and actually causes long-term problems for the inhabitants of cities. Okay, let's discuss where the fallout lands and how much radiation there is in the fallout. All right, the fallout begins actually very quickly, upwards of maybe 15 minutes after the detonation. However, that first fallout, even though it's very heavy, is actually very low radiation. What we're actually looking at is 24 hours later, that's when the real heavy, dangerous fallout occurs. Usually we're looking at about 30 miles downwind from the detonation. In fact, the downwind, if here's the detonation, the actual wind will carry it in a cigar shape from that detonation going that way. Again, 24 to 48 hours is the most dangerous part. However, if there's heavy winds, like 30 miles an hour winds pushing it, it's not unlikely for the fallout to actually go maybe 70 miles an hour or 70 miles, I should say, in just that short amount of time, in just a few hours. Overall, however, fallout can descend for hundreds of miles from the detonation site. It's just the further you go, the less radiation. Where the fallout drops depends on the location of the blast. For most of the United States, the prevailing winds blow from west to east, so if detonation happens just to the west of you, you are in the most vulnerable position. However, that's not always the case. Make sure you know the wind patterns for where you live, and they change. You know, like in Florida, it's not uncommon to actually have from west to east or start shifting north to south. So watch this. Make sure you actually see where the fallout patterns go and keep up on that so you can make sure you're out of that fallout zone if there is a detonation near you. Okay, here's how we are affected. Adults actually have very little risk of inhaling or swallowing fallout particles. I know that's surprising. Remember, it's made up of larger particles and occasional small particles too. But, you know, it's not even recommended you have to wear a mask, surprisingly. However, if I'm caught outside with fallout, which you don't want to be there, I'm probably going to wear a mask. Hopefully I have one with me. But as far as the radiation and the fallout going into your home, you know, there's actually very slight possibility that'll happen. You know, any type of really strong wind shears may push it into your house. But simply closing your windows in those cases and your doors and everything should actually uh, give you ample protection to make sure the fallout doesn't enter your home. However, ingestion, by far, is what we have to worry about, taking it in by mouth. So fallout on the skin shouldn't actually make you panic. Just as soon as you step inside, take off your outer layer of clothes, which is actually going to have most of the fallout on there, go right into the shower. Shower it off. Now, it's not just the mouth, but the eyes and nose and such too. You don't want the fallout to get inside of you. Your skin is actually a very good protection layer. Granted, if you have a big gash on there, that's not good. You need to wash it out. But if we're talking about just normal skin integrity, you know, wash your hair, make sure your eyes and mouth are closed as much as possible, then wash your face off. As long as you wash yourself completely down, you'll actually get that radiation fallout off of you. And 
uh, as opposed to what we, most people think, the radiation doesn't stick with you. It doesn't work that way. You wash off the fallout and you're washing off the radiation as well. But again, just don't get it in your nose, your eyes, your mouth, nothing like that. Understand though, if it was on your clothes and your skin, you have been given a dose of radiation. You may actually have damage occurring to your cells. So getting out of the fallout as fast as possible, shedding off that layer, getting it off of you as fast as possible is the absolute key. And what we're looking at is if you're looking at about being 20 or 25 miles downrange and the fallout starts coming on you, remember we talked about 24 hours into it, it's the most dangerous time, you need to get out of the fallout as fast as possible. And if you're actually in that fallout for upwards of 25 minutes, you're probably going to die. It's that lethal. Now again, fallout doesn't necessarily make something radioactive. For example, let's say you actually have a plastic tub of food out on your porch and the fallout falls on it. If you can wash off the fallout from the top and the fallout did not come in contact with the food, the food is just fine, it's okay. But you have to understand, if the fallout comes in contact with food, that's not a good thing. Or with a soil and a plant grows, how about this? You have a plant growing through the fallout, that plant's going to absorb that fallout radioactive material. And of course, if you eat that plant, that's bad. Or even a worst case scenario, if you actually have a cow out in the field who survived this and, and is eating the plants that actually have the radioactive material, the cow actually will get the radioactive material as well. Even the milk that the cow makes will become radioactive. And that's actually especially dangerous for little kids. It can be fatal for them if they drink that milk. So it's always best to have powdered milk on hand in your fallout shelter. Of course, keep enough food and water for you and your family, and it's gotta be for at least two weeks. You know, a month's supply is preferable, but two weeks will work. And of course, I recommend much longer than that for the fact that, yeah, the radiation may be low enough so you can go out in two weeks, but with plants contaminated, animals contaminated, and guarantee the supply chain's gonna be messed up, it already is, we're looking at serious catastrophic problems and you're gonna be looking for food. So try to have as much food in your house as possible before the attack occurs. That's like right now, obviously. Okay, the US government has had in the past and still actually stockpiles food for such an emergency. But I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't want to depend on the government getting that to me, not to mention you know other people trying to get it as well. So try to stock up for this for yourself as much as possible. Concerning shelter, public fallout shelters are not so public anymore. They're just hard to find. Nor could most of them support the growth of the population of today. Let's face it, most of these were designed in the 50s and 60s, not with our modern population. So um, your best bet, by the way, is your basement or even a fallout shelter, which we'll talk about in a minute. But as long as you actually have heavy, dense material between you and the fallout, the more dense and heavy it is, the better off you'll be. The shelter does not have to be anything special or high tech, not at all. It literally can be any space that has heavy material surrounding it in all directions. Even digging your own shelter is easy by design. Just don't depend on a simple piece of plywood as a roof. The radiation will pass straight through it like it wasn't even there. Placing heavy layers of earth, dirt, bricks, cement as the roof for that, as well as their sides if there is any, hopefully your shelter is actually inside the ground, the better off you are. But you know, basement actually provides already some cement there, and of course it's lower. We're actually looking at dirt there as well. It's actually a better place if you have a basement. If you don't have one, there are still civil shelters out there. Out there, You might actually wanna go ahead of time to find out where they're at. If not, you know, subway stations and tunnels, things like that can actually give you a lot of protection. Unfortunately, the inner hallways of your home won't provide much protection. Consider this. The American Nuclear Society states that you need as much as 13.8 feet of water or 6.6 .6 feet of concrete or 1.3 feet of lead for protection. So honestly, if you're in a basement, of course we're looking at lots of dirt on the outside and maybe what a foot or two of concrete, it does give you a much better chance. However, think about this, most basements actually only come up to a certain level, then it's just that relatively thin layer of concrete to the outside. That's not gonna work. Overall, it's best to keep as far from the radioactive material as possible, stay away from the fallout, including stay in the center of the home, in the basement. Okay, I've seen on other channels incorrect information, and it actually used to be part of our civil defense, that if you don't have a basement to go to, if you haven't actually built a bomb shelter, etc., and a nuclear bomb happens, just take your table and cover it with food and put food and cans on the side of it and try to build up like a tent that you're gonna live inside of it for two weeks. And uh, they say that, that if that's better than nothing, but I'll be honest with you, 
I don't think it's even better than anything. I don't think it's going to work. Uh, in, in fact, it's actually disappeared from a lot of the different types of literature saying it's, it's pointless. Think about this. If you actually have to have so many feet of concrete or over a foot of lead, which is actually amazing at stopping radiation, what is a couple cans going to do for you or a couple boxes? Practically nothing. You're going to stand much be a much better chance, by the way, if you find out in your town or city where there's actual uh, a civil defense shelter. Most people don't know where these are at anymore. So you actually stand a better chance of knowing where it's at so you can get there. And a lot of people aren't going to be able to find it or know to go in there. So that's my option for you if you simply don't have it in your house, if you haven't done the preps you need to. But doing the table and stuff, it's kind of outdated information. It doesn't really work anymore. It's not the thinking anymore. Now, besides protection from your shelter, there should be things in your shelter to keep you alive for weeks. Obviously, again, food and water are the most obvious. Now, food and water inside your home will be completely safe to eat. Think about it this way. If the fallout's out here and you have a wall, I don't care if it's even the thinnest of wall and you have your food in here, the radiation will pass through your food. But the food itself doesn't become radioactive. That's actually a fallacy that some people think. Not at all. Um, now, I will warn you that cans, especially we're talking about like iron cans, which I don't know if we even have those anymore. Um, I don't think aluminum will do it, but iron will. It can actually become radioactive itself. So whenever you're talking about types of steel, steel cans or steel pipes and everything, you know those pipes can actually become radioactive. Uh, it's called neutron radiation. We'll talk about, again, radioactivity in the next video. But the food itself doesn't become radioactive. You don't have to worry about any of your stockpiles getting messed up from the radioactive decay and the, the stuff taking place outside your home. But again, I will warn you that if you actually have food, again, that was touching the radioactive material or fallout, that food is not good to eat anymore. You definitely do not want to ingest that. It's got to be food that actually stays away from and doesn't come in contact with the fallout. Water, it's relatively simple. If you're on a well, you have no problems as long as the well is covered. The fallout can't move through the earth and it will be filtered before you take it to your home anyway. The earth does the filtering. And surprisingly, city water should be fine too. Um, because what we're looking at is the water often has actually separation from outside air. But if you're talking about water coming from a wet reservoir, again, the fallout is not this dust floating around the air, it's heavy glass and sand particles. And if it does fall in a reservoir that actually supplies your town water, the particles fall quickly to the bottom. And on top of that, the water is often filtered before it comes to your house. Just watch the TV if it's working, your radio, listen to the news announcements, and they'll tell you if the water's safe or not. But at the very least, if they say the water's not safe, all you have to do is filter it. It's very simple. Just put it through some type of, like if you have a Berkey or some type of sand, rock, and charcoal water filter, it'll all work just fine for you. But honestly, that's not even a concern. It'll, it won't last very long. The water does not hold the radioactivity in those situations. And again, just listen to what the news tells you, and you should be, you'll be just fine. Now, for a single one megaton detonation, be prepared to stay in your shelter for at least two weeks. You'd be surprised how much radiation is gone after two weeks. We'll talk about that in the next video. In the event of a full-scale nuclear war, however, like a hundred of these warheads, it's enough to kill every single person, plant, and animal on the planet. And I'm constantly getting comments from people saying, that's what's going to happen. We're going to have a complete annihilation, an extinction level event where it's going to kill off every single thing on the planet. We have nothing to worry about if that's the case. We're talking about a single nuke. Don't you know that Russia knows it's going to kill everybody? China knows this. North Korea, America. We all know it's going to kill everybody. So with that in mind, they know that there's no win situation by launching all the nukes. Launching one nuke, however, can actually be a deterrent. It was actually is being discussed right now by some of our enemy countries. Just keep that in mind. So we want to be able to repair in case there's one nuke or maybe two and if there's a whole bunch of them, then we all have nothing to worry about. Okay, the next video is radiation. We'll talk about its effects on the human body and go through the different types of radiation and where it may land, how long it'll last, and how we're going to deal with that too. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you're enjoying this nuclear series as much as you can enjoy something like this. And go ahead and check out this next video on prepping.